I'm Pat McGuinn, an Associate Professor of Political Science and Education at Drew University in New Jersey. Along with Paul Manna, uh, my co-editor and co-conspirator on the project, I'd like to thank uh, Daniela Fairchild, uh, Checker Finn and the Fordham Institute staff, uh, and Cindy Brown and the Center for American Progress crew for inviting us to undertake this effort uh, and for their sponsorship of the project. We would also like to thank uh, and express our gratitude to the Capitol Hilton for hosting today's event and to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Doris and Donald Fisher Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, and the Broad Foundation for providing the financial support to make this project possible. Uh, last but certainly not least, we'd also like to thank uh, our discussants uh, for coming today to share their wisdom and experience and insights uh, on the papers that we've gathered, uh, as well as uh, thank our all-star cast of authors for producing such an outstanding uh, set uh, of papers. We are eager for this to be uh, an interactive event today, and we've incorporated a good deal of time inside of each panel session for question and answers uh, with the audience and we encourage your active participation uh, as your comments and suggestions to us and to the individual authors will be invaluable as we revise uh, the papers for publication in book form in fall 2012. So that's something else uh, to look for. Before we can move on to the substance of the day, a couple of quick business items. First of all, please, if everyone can just take a moment and, and silence uh, your, your cell phones. I'm sure your new Justin Bieber ringtone is really extraordinary, uh, but in this context, it'll be a little embarrassing for you and distracting um, to the rest of us. So if you could turn the cell phones off, that would be terrific. Uh, copies of the, all the papers being presented today are available right outside here in the library, as well as on the Fordham website at www.edexcellence.net. Uh, right below the streaming uh, webcast of today's event. The event is also being videoed and will be available online in its entirety in a few weeks. The tweeters uh, in the group should follow and, and be a part of the conversation if you'd like as well uh, on Twitter using the hashtag RethinkEdGov. Uh, and then finally, uh, the lunchroom where New Jersey Education Commissioner Chris Cerf will be speaking later on uh, is we have full registration for today, uh, full lineup uh, of folks for the lunch as well. So you will need your name tags, uh, please, to get into the lunch. So thanks for the business part of this. Um, now let me provide a, a brief uh, overview uh, of the project as a whole. Um, both uh, uh, an overview of the Rethinking Education Governance Project of which this book as a part, and then a, a roadmap for today's conference. So, Several decades of intense American school reform efforts have produced, at best, marginal gains in student achievement. A recent report by the National Center on Education and the Economy, for example, concluded that the country's education system is neither coherent nor poised to realize great gains in the near future. This conference and the book that will come out of it begins with the premise that the structure of American education governance itself, highly fragmented, decentralized, politicized, and bureaucratic, undercuts the development and sustenance of the changes needed to improve educational opportunities and academic performance of the nation's students. Federalism has produced dramatic variation across and within each state, while a historic attachment to localism has left superintendents, principals, and elected school board members to make most major decisions involving personnel, programming, and budgets. The existence of over 14,000 school districts nationwide makes it extraordinarily difficult for federal and state officials to provide effective oversight and for local officials, officials to leverage their collective efforts. At the same time, individual school leaders have lost discretionary power in the face of many mandates from district, state, and federal policymakers. The hierarchical organization of American public schools has often produced compl a compliance culture that stifles the ability and willingness of school teachers and leaders to improve school practice either organically uh, or to faithfully execute uh, e external reforms. Insiders who work inside the diverse institutions that oversee education as well as outsiders hoping to advance new ideas, regularly express frustration with existing arrangements. Local school officials and teachers lament the apparent loss of flexibility that has come with accelerating standardization and testing. State administrators, board members, legislators, and governors, on the other hand, struggle to advance their own initiatives 
while simultaneously responding to mandates from state and national courts and the federal government. Those working outside of the traditional education system who offer new methods for instructing children, organizing schools, integrating technology, and ushering teachers into the profession uh, are often stymied as they try to implement their initiatives and bring them to scale amidst the complex web of institutions and rules that govern education. Even where new institutions have emerged that appear to break with prior practices, as with boards that authorize and oversee charter schools, uh, or collaborative efforts such as the Common Core State Standards Initiative, many questions remain about whether these new arrangements can deliver on their ambitious promises absent broader structural changes in education governance. In short, while public officials, advocates, and researchers may and indeed do disagree on how to improve governance, there is considerable consensus, a consensus at this point in time that such improvements in governance are an essential precondition if the country is to achieve its urgent educational goals. With such agreement that the nation can and must govern education better, the moment is ripe for a comprehensive assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of what remains of the old, what has emerged to date of the new, and what alternatives to current governing arrangements may produce better educational outcomes for children. It is our great hope that this analysis can inform future attempts to adapt the country's 19th and 20th century governance structure and education to the new and changing and more ambitious demands of the 21st century. Thanks. So Pat and I have been uh, tag teaming this project from the beginning um, when we got involved. Um, thanks to Checker and Cindy for asking us. Um, my name is Paul Manna. I'm an uh, associate professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary. And what I wanted to do is just offer a few overall framing um, points um, to kind of think about as we move through the day and as you kind of hear the panels. There, were, there are really um, a few um, things that we had in mind with this project, the, the, the conference and the book that will emerge um, from it. Really, we're hoping to sort of clear a path in a way for some fresh thinking, some future thinking about schools, um, and some changes that we think could be useful for improving educational practice and effectiveness. And so the three contributions that we we see the project and the discussion here making are, are these. Um, first, the approach that we're taking to, uh, today and in the larger book project focuses on broad issues of governance and institutional structure and the behaviors that those kinds of things promote, rather than narrow questions of policy. So if you think about it, much of the discussion and the debate when you read the headlines about education, you see stories and conversations centered around topics such as these. Are grant competitions a better way to distribute education funds than traditional formula allocations? This is an important question nowadays. Should teachers be evaluated based in part on student performance? Do students need to be tested in all or many grade levels in order to have an effective accountability regime? And then finally, just as one other example, what should be done in schools that struggle to perform well? Should more money, more assistance be provided? Should there be some restaffing, more dramatic organizational changes, something else? What, what should happen in these schools? These are a lot of the questions that animate um, contemporary policy debates, but really our project and the discussions we're going to have today are going to try to shift the focus a bit. Um, rather than considering policy change and reform along these more narrow um, topics, we want to consider it through the more general lens of governance, um, hoping to shift the focus from the, from the trees of particular policy debates to the broader forest. This is one um, important contribution of the work, I think. Um, the second is that what we want to offer and we, we think we will offer is an, is an assessment of, governments, of governance that is somewhat comprehensive um, rather than studying a relatively narrow set of institutions or issues. So it's not as if nobody has ever studied governance in education. Um, people have and people have done some great work. Um, often the focus is on a particular institution like school districts um, or a particular level of government, say the federal government or the states. Um, what we've tried to do here is assemble some, um, some papers and authors who are going to look at these things across the board. So different levels of government, different institutions inside of government, and importantly, different institutions outside of government that have some bearing on governance. Um, that's a second major um, contribution, I think. 
And then third, one of the final point that makes this project somewhat different than others, we think, is an intentional effort to offer some important comparative um, perspectives. Um, you'll see um, some papers and you'll hear discussion today that compares the situation in the United States um, with other countries around the world, not simply putting up um, tables of test scores showing where the U.S. falls on various international assessments, but looking more deeply at how do other countries organize themselves to manage and run education and what might, might we learn in the United States um, um, from those things. We're also going to see some comparisons to other domestic policy areas, in particular health care um, and environmental policy, which are also fragmented, um, challenging environments to work with. We see some useful parallels for education. So you'll he hear that comparative perspective. And ultimately, you'll hear a comparative perspective given the nature of the authors we've assembled. We have some people um, uh, like Pat and myself, who our main work is in universities as researchers and teachers at the college level. Um, we also have people who are practitioners at state, local, and other levels. Um, and we have some people who've worked um, uh, you know, in, in academia and outside and, and, and have done lots of very interesting things. Um, one thing that you can be assured of is that we did not select the presenters um, today because they all agree on some sort of unified vision of what governance um, should look like. Um, in fact, um, all do agree that we need to do some things better, but um, there will be no groupthink um, on the panels or in the discussion today, I promise you. Um, so with that as a bit of an overview, um, you see the schedule as we'll move forward um, for the rest of the day. Um, we have a couple of panels in the morning and then the lunchtime keynote from Chris Cerf along with some panels in the afternoon and some closing remarks. Um, and then we invite you all to join us for a reception at the end of the day. Um, so with that, let me um, introduce quickly and turn it over to Checker Finn, um, who will who give some opening remarks. Um, uh, Checker, as you know, is president of the Thomas B. Fordham um, Institute and also senior fellow at Hoover. And I could spend 10 more minutes introducing him, but it's, it, it's time. It's time. So, so let's go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you both. As I think you can all already discern, they've been doing a fantastic job of uh, uh, organizing uh, this uh, project, uh, this uh, uh, conference, and the book, the book to follow. They've also uh, thanked most of the people I was uh, coming up here to start by thanking, as well as the four foundations that have uh, uh, underwritten uh, this venture. So let me, uh, uh, let me launch right in uh, and be a little more substantive. My colleagues and I at Fordham, uh, prodded by our board member, Rod Page, uh, former U.S. Secretary of Education, as well as our own analysis of the snail's pace of education reform, have concluded that the inherited structures and governance arrangements of public education in, in America are not just uh, archaic, inefficient, and dysfunctional. There are also major impediments to the successful adoption and implementation of just about every promising reform on the horizon. Yet analysts and reformers have mostly shunned this topic, either because it's so wonky and boring compared with, let's say, merit pay or vouchers or national standards, uh, or because they don't think anything can be done about it, so why waste time and energy talking about it? Well, our friends and frequent colleagues at the Center for American Progress have reached much the same conclusion about the need to uh, surface this issue. So we've teamed up the two organizations in a multifaceted, multi-year effort to get the problems of structure and governance on to the education reform docket in a serious way. We've already held several smaller events and written some articles on the topic, but today marks the, uh, the debut of the first major project of our joint governance initiative, uh, the assembling of this serious book that probes both problems and possible solutions in, the, in this realm. You've already heard from uh, Paul and Pat, who agreed to do the assembling and editing, and uh, 14 draft chapters destined to be, turn into chapters in that book are now available on our website. Most of them are also on today's agenda for uh, discussion in the panels. Uh, the paper that isn't part of a panel is Mike Petrilli's and mine on what's wrong with the current governance system. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now by way of a kind of stage setter uh, for the panels to follow. Uh, we contend that America's management system for K-12 education uh, is a confused and tangled web involving way too many levels of government with ill-defined responsibilities and conflicting interests. As a result, over the past 50 years, obsolescence, clumsiness, and misalignment have come to define the governance of public education. It's not anybody's fault. It's just what happens when opportunities and needs change, but structures don't. The system of schooling we have today is the legacy of the 19th century, and it's hopelessly outmoded in the 21st century. 
The foremost failing of the system is too many cooks stirring the same soup and nobody really in charge. Americans bow before the altar of local control, yet in fact nearly every major decision affecting the education of our kids is shaped and often distorted by at least four separate levels of governance. Washington, the state capital, the local district, and the individual school itself. And that's without even considering uh, intermediate units such as uh, uh, counties and regional education uh, centers, uh, or courts, or parents themselves. This fragmented governance does, of course, confer a kind of stability on the system, uh, but it's the stability of inertia and gridlock, whereby dozens of interest groups, influencers, and decision makers can block change, and in which it's exceptionally difficult to forge the kind of coalition or consensus that might facilitate change. This would be okay if the outcomes, the productivity, and the efficiency of the system were satisfactory. But at a time when the demand for reform and improvement and equity and greater effectiveness is heard from every direction, stability through inertia and fragmentation is not good for our children or our country. Now, those who disagree with this analysis will invoke democracy in defense of the present arrangement. They will assert that different communities have different education priorities. They will argue that Americans, by and large, have the schools they want or perhaps deserve, and will cite poll data indicating that most parents are content with their own children's schools. Uh, nobody uh, trumps Mike's and my affection for democracy, but when it yields an education system that pays greater deference to the desires and interests of its employees, its vendors, and its other adult beneficiaries than to those of the families and communities that it serves, this is a pretty shabby form of democracy, uh, and one that we think cries out for a serious makeover. Examples abound, I think, of how the current uh, structures get in the way of reform. Uh, you could look at uh, digital learning as one example. Technology is transforming uh, the opportunities for delivering education. Scores of online schools have opened. The biggest of them operate throughout entire states. They could just as easily be interstate or nationwide. After all, political borders do not constrain the reach of the internet, except maybe in China. Um, but uh, which of our governments should write the ground rules for cyber schooling and hold its vendors to account for it, their results? Who should set distance learning's academic requirements and assessments? And who should pay for kids to attend schools? Or even more complicated, uh, take separate courses from several uh, online providers in order to assemble a curriculum tailored to each student. Uh, who pays for this? Who regulates this? Who governs this? Is it the district? Is it the state? Is it Uncle Sam? Uh, and what we're encumbered by the old LEA model and its geographically bounded jurisdiction, um, and uh, uh, that means that we really have no governance mechanism well suited to answering these questions in a, uh, in a digital age. Thus, the potential for digital learning as an alternative to underperforming schools remains barely tapped, and the financing and rulemaking in this realm remain absurdly complicated. Consider teacher preparation. Today, states continue to certify teachers, but districts and individual charter schools employ them. Uh, Washington, meanwhile, superimposes rules of its own, a so-called highly qualified teacher in every classroom, while national nonprofits like TFA circumvent some of these restrictions and recruit and place instructors all over the country. Because of our patchwork governance system, there is little uniformity in preparation, there's dubious quality control, there's limited portability of credentials, skills, pensions, you name it. As for the effectiveness of those teachers, we know it matters hugely in student learning, and we also know that it varies enormously. A child-centered education system would take for granted that those leading schools would have the authority, as well as the responsibility, to maximize the number of highly effective instructors within their walls and minimize the number of duds. Yet tenure laws, first in, first, last in, first out provisions, union contracts, which are in effect part of the governance system, uh, block school principals from replacing duds with superstars while conferring job security on individuals whose presence in the building is not necessarily good for kids. Now consider the tangle of school finance. Nationwide, state taxes generate about 47 cents of the public school dollar. Local taxes, mostly on property, yield about 43 cents, and Washington kicks in the remaining dime. But this distribution varies enormously from places where the state portion barely reaches one-third to states that cover more than 70 percent, and the variation is even greater within states. Despite round after round of equity lawsuits, 
as well as the supposed cushion provided by statewide foundation funding levels, the financing of schools across the U.S. is sorely uneven and confused. This has so far stumped everyone trying to devise and implement such promising reforms as weighted student funding, where the full amount, uh, a tailored amount, would follow the kid to the actual school that he or she attends. As for charter schooling, these independently operated public schools are meant to provide alternatives to district schools and in most places are designed to compete with district schools, giving choices to families, offering an escape hatch to kids and creating at least a partial marketplace within what has long been a near monopoly. Yet most US charter schools owe their very licenses to operate to the school system they aren't supposed to compete with. Under most state charter laws, would-be school operators have nowhere else to turn for uh, their charters, for their licenses to operate. Unsurprisingly, most district bureaucracies abhor these upstart rivals and use their own power and influence uh, to do all they can to contain the growth of charters and, where possible, to eradicate them. Even the signature education reform effort of the past 20 years, the imposition of academic standards and accountability for meeting them, has been stymied by our dysfunctional approach to school governance. The structure makes it almost impossible, for example, to address the question of what do you do with a district that fails to meet the higher standards? What do you do with especially bad schools? Dropout factories, some say, that fail completely in their most basic mission. Whose job is it to fix them? The federal government? The state? The district? Those self-same districts that allowed these schools to fail in the first place? Sometimes year after year? What reason is there to believe that these districts uh, would or would know how to move to set things right? Given these obstacles, it's no accident that the major education reforms of the past quarter century have come from outside the traditional education governance structures. Whether one looks at the development of academic standards, the imposition of testing and accountability regimes, the spread of school choice, or innovations in teacher preparation, evaluation, and compensation, the impetus almost never originates with state or local boards of education or the people who work for them. Rather, such initiatives have come from governors and business leaders, from mayors and national commissions, from private foundations, and even from the White House. The problem is that while ardent outsiders like these can catalyze all sorts of reforms, Putting them into practice and bringing them to scale generally depends on the traditional management structures of public education. That's the way the system is structured. It's those folks who write the detailed regulations, run the schools, manage the money, and employ the people that work in the classroom. And that is where any reform momentum slows to a creep. The traditional structure is typically lethargic, bureaucratic, and set in its ways. While people in it have experience managing schools and complying with the rules they write, seldom do they have the capacity to innovate, to make judgments about matters beyond their customary duties, or to stage successful interventions in failing districts, schools, or classrooms. Moreover, many of these people fiercely oppose the policies that the outsiders are asking them to implement. It thus seems that regardless of the innovative solutions that may emerge from foundations, think tanks, legislative committees, wherever, and no matter how many promising policies are propagated from state capitals and from Washington, the, uh, our current approach to governing schools will remain a roadblock to reform actually taking place. Let's briefly, before I subside, tackle one more problem, uh, which begins with a shibboleth, namely local control of the schools. Despite America's romantic attachment to this phrase, the way it works today offers a kind of worst of both worlds scenario. On the one hand, district level power constrains individual schools. Its standardizing bureaucratic and political force ties the hands of principals when it comes to budgets, staffing, and curriculum. On the other hand, local control is not strong enough to clear the obstacles that state and federal governments place before reform-minded board members and superintendents in those relatively few places where such people can be found. That is why, incidentally, even the staunchest proponents of local control are less than thrilled with today's governance arrangements. From their perspective, state and federal decision makers, and indeed parents availing themselves of school choice opportunities, are power grabs that diminish coherent control from anywhere at all and make it actually difficult even for uh, reform-minded locals to successfully govern their own schools. Some people have described education governance in America 
as a layer cake. Others call it a marble cake because the jurisdictions of different governments and agencies are so jumbled. Still others favor the image of a loosely coupled train where movement at the uh, engine doesn't necessarily produce any motion in the caboose. Um, I favor the analogy of a vast food court with multiple kitchens, each with many cooks, yet with no head chef in command of even a single kitchen, much less of the entire enterprise. Consider so seemingly straightforward a decision as which teacher will be employed to fill a seventh grade opening at the Lincoln School, located in, let's say, Metropolis, West Carolina. You might think Lincoln's principal should decide which candidate is likeliest to succeed in that particular classroom. But under the usual arrangement, the, the most that principal might be able to do is veto wholly unsatisfactory candidates. And often not even that, considering seniority and bumping rights within the district, uh, considering collective bargaining contract provisions and often state law. The superintendent's HR office downtown does most of the vetting and placing, but it too is shackled by the contract <coughs> by state licensure practices, which may in turn be set by a union and ed school dominated professional standards board, by seniority rules that may be enshrined in both contract and state law, and by uniform salary schedules, sometimes statewide, that mean the new teacher, assuming similar credentials, will be paid the same amount whether the subject that Lincoln needs is math or phys ed. Washington gets into the Act II with HQT requirements that constrain the school and the HR department. By the end of the process, at least a dozen different governing units have impeded the principal's authority to staff his or her school with the ablest and best suited teachers uh, available. But teacher selection is only one example of the too many cooks problem. You could say the same about special ed. You could say the same about budgeting and control of the school's funds. You could certainly say the same about school discipline. What great leader or change agent would want to become a school principal under this circumstance? Or a local superintendent or even a teacher? Well, maybe in a comfy and probably smug suburban setting, but probably not in the places that most need outstanding talent. American education, in our view, doesn't need czars or dictators. Separation of powers and checks and balances are important elements of our democracy. Kids and communities do differ, and there needs to be flexibility in the system to adapt and adjust to singular circumstances. Uh, but today our public education system lacks flexibility and nimbleness of all sorts. Surely that's not what the founders had in mind. It's most definitely not what our children need. Are we stuck with this setup forever? Whose interests does it actually advance? What might be done differently? and how, if at all, might change actually come about in this sphere. That's what today is about. That's what this book is about. That's what this project is about. Um, thank you again for joining us today. And we are now launched. Panel one. OK, panel one, come on up. Good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning. Hey, All right. We need to get some energy in this room. Uh, you know, the classroom style is, is helpful for all of you uh, out there taking notes and tweeting. By the way, I noticed I, I've been doing most of the tweeting here lately, guys. Come on, get with it here. Uh, RethinkEdGov is the hashtag. Uh, folks are following along at home, and they, they want to hear your thoughts. Uh, on things, for example, like Checker's tie, which I just tweeted about a few minutes ago, <laughs> which uh, I always know it's conference day when Checker wears his uh, friendly kitty tie, uh, which is great. OK. That was a good filler. Wow, that was quick, guys. Nicely, <laughs> nicely done. Hi, I'm Mike Petrilli, uh, Executive Vice President at Fordham, and excited to be here with you today. Uh, you've already heard Pat and Paul and Checker start to sketch out the problems of education governance. We're going to go deeper now with this panel who is going to make you even more depressed about our current <laughs> education governance system. Uh, we've, uh, we've got uh, two folks that are going to talk about school finance. Uh, first, Marguerite Rosa from the Center for Reinventing Public Education at the University of Washington, who's going to talk about the way that our current governance system uh, has this too many cooks in the kitchen problem and makes it very hard for rational decisions to be made. Uh, Cindy Brown. Uh, the director of the education policy program at the Center for American Progress, our wonderful partner on this project, who's going to talk about the issues around equity 
We all know that having 14,000 school districts, uh, each with their own local property tax bases, um, creates a system that's uh, quite inequitable. And so what are the challenges uh, that our governance system uh, presents in terms of making our system more equitable? Uh, then we've got Michelle Davis, a contributing writer at Education Week and its Digital Directions, uh, that's going to talk about challenges uh, that face folks who are trying to innovate uh, from within the system. Uh, so these are people who are reformers, who are trying to get things done, make things better, make reform happen, and the ways in which today's governance system makes it hard for them. And then Stephen Wilson, who's the president of Ascend Learning, uh, who's going to talk about the challenges that our governance system presents to innovators outside the system. Uh, so we're going to let them each go for 10 minutes each. A few of them have PowerPoints. Uh, they're going to uh, not try to cover every little detail in their, in their 7,000 word papers, uh, but to give you some of the most important insights. And then we'll get into the, some, some real rich discussion about uh, the ways that the governance system uh, makes things harder uh, when it comes to making uh, reform happen, but also uh, just making a system that, regardless of what you think about reform, uh, works more coherently and rationally. So let's get started with Marguerite Rosa. So do you want us to stay here? Uh, why don't you come up? Okay. And I'll go sit down so I can keep tweeting. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, oops, here we go. The machinery that drives education spending decisions inhibits better use of resources. That's the premise of mine. And I thought I would start uh, with the money in the morning. I feel like we could talk about decision making around a whole lot of different things, but all of the relevant decision making is really about the money. So if you follow the money, you actually get the real story. Um, so. The first question is, how much money are we talking about in public education? Um, and some of you might know it's $600 billion. And um, by way of reference, do you think that's bigger or smaller than what we spend on the military? I don't think, I don't think we ask this very much. It's actually just a little bit smaller, but, but barely. So it's a, lot, it's a lot of money. And in fact, there are more people in education than there are in the military. Um, and so the next question, of course, is who decides how to spend the $600 billion? Is it our Secretary of Ed? <laughs> uh, Mike Petrilli told me that our job is to entertain, not to really cover our paper. So I should not put a PowerPoint, sir. Um, any question? Anyway, it's not him. It's not. We don't have a person in charge of how to spend the $600 billion. In fact, it's not the governors either. This is supposed to be a picture of the governors. Um, so who is it who actually makes the decision about how to spend that $600 billion? School boards do. School boards actually hold the authority in almost every state to decide how to spend the cash. That's their responsibility. And here's a nice school board from Arkansas. But actually, school boards are a lot of people. It's about 60,000 people are school board members. So we're talking about a group of decision makers over that 600 billion that are vast and largely decentralized. Um, so, so when we think about that question, we think, well, so who are the school board members? And I'm not going to go on about their training and who runs for office and who gets elected. But, um, but their responsibility is to manage quite a bit of money. And the median student in this country um, is, is in a district where the school board manages just over $100 million. So these are big financial responsibilities um, and ones that I don't think that we appreciate um, often enough when we think about that, that role. So the next key feature here is that the school boards are playing with house money. It's not theirs for the most part. Um, more of it, I'm, and Cindy's going to talk more about the revenue side and I'm really talking more about the spending side. But you can see that the, the largest share of it is from federal and state. That's more than their own money. But they're making decisions about how to spend revenues that are raised and deployed in other sectors of government. Um, and that's, that's interesting. So at a certain point, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, school boards, what about, you forgot a few of the players here. And it's true. Um, it's not just that school boards operate in a vacuum. In fact, there are quite a few players that are doing everything they can to influence the decisions that school boards make over those $600 billion. And I've listed a few here. So there's the Department of Ed, the, the governors, the, the state education associations, um, agencies, the legislatures, parents, school employees, unions, voters, courts. They're all trying to exert influence on that, those dollars. And they do it in lots of the ways 
that uh, we heard in the opening session. Um, and what you end up with is this very complex maze of um, rules and regulations and policies and promises and practices that it's like it's it's like a web holding the dollars in place and keeping them moving in this incremental, uh, fairly stagnant um, way that makes sure that the money is very not well aligned with priorities. So um, I, I have a lot of that in the in the chapter, but I d didn't want to spend too much time on that today. In part because a lot of you've heard me speak of that before, how the money doesn't end up going out and landing on students in the way that we say are our priorities. So what I do highlight, though, is the result of this system, um, which is that the spending is misaligned with stated goals. Um, and on that point, you see things like, you know, we, we're really trying to close the achievement gap between our high and low performing students, but we spend more money on AP and honors classes. Uh, we spend higher sal we put higher salary teachers in front of um, higher achieving students um, and those kinds of things. You see, you see findings like um, uh, you know the, the stated goals are things like we really are trying to focus in on math and English um, and writing and reading, and yet the the money goes out in ways that um, spend more money on an elective than an English class, and um, and so you see that kind of thing where you're um, spending is very much misaligned with your goals. Um, and I, I have uh, in the chapter a lot of, of, of those sorts of findings, but I actually wanted to focus on number two and three here, which is that the system we have also creates um, distorted input pricing. And, and what you have in other areas of the economy is that prices are determined by what the buyers and sellers agree to in a market. And that's actually not what happens in public education. Prices are actually determined in part by the finance policies that are designed to affect the spending. And I'll show you how that works in a second. And the third point is that the structure of decision making around finance, where you have one group deciding how to spend the money and the rest of these layers actually trying to influence their decisions about how to spend the money, instead of deciding whether to withdraw the cash or, or put the cash in. They try to send down rules and policies and, and contracts and everything else to create some predictability in the spending. Well, it's creating a finance structure that's not sustainable. So I'll give you a little bit of information on that. Um, and the, uh, the fourth point I cover is that the system is unable to adapt and innovate. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I think there are other people who are gonna talk about that point. So, so back to this input pricing, I'll, I'll, I'll show you here um, from a pick on my hometown in Seattle, but you can see the blue lines are the salary raises given out to continuing teachers in the years um, right up through the recession. And the red are, um, are the local cost of living uh, CPI in changes in that same time period. And what you'll see is that teachers got an 8% raise, an 8% raise, and then a 14% raise in the 2008-2009 school year. So remember that year? It's kind of a, a weak economic year for us. So uh, that's a large raise given what was going on in the economy and, and one that what many would argue was out of step with what was re would be required in the market to encourage people to retain their job. No one left. There were no other jobs to be had. Uh, in fact, attrition dropped through the floor that year. So why the 14% raise? I asked a school board member, wow, this is a good year for teachers. And he said, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the teachers got a 14% raise this year. And he said, they did? When did we approve that? I don't remember approving that. Um, and he looked very confused. And, and, and he didn't approve it, right? It's built into tons of policies. It's built into step and column changes. Um, it's built into... Uh, uh, promises from the state if you go out and get um, uh, a master's degree or a, a, a national board certification. And it was in the fifth year of a labor contract agreed back when the economy was in a, a completely different place. So these things creep up and they stay in the system and they don't become part of decision making even though that's the group that's supposed to be deciding those. Um, I, I also, just to illustrate the point, want to ask this question. What costs more, a science math teacher or a PE teacher? So I'm putting this in a kind of a pricing terms. Well, we've created a system where a PE teacher costs more. 
they're not the same. They're on the same salary schedule, but PE teachers stay in the system, and math and science teachers tend to turn over. So math and science teachers land on the, on the low end of the salary schedule, and you have, on average, um, in different districts, very high-cost PE teachers and low-cost math and science ones. Again, these are sort of the policies that we put in place by lots of players um, that work in interaction with a lot of different variables to create these, um, these distortions. Um, and our, our, our next point here, I want to show you another example. Um, and this is a, a handout, again, from picking my hometown. But it, they sent this to the parents and said, remember, ridership week is um, Monday the 18th through Friday the 22nd. Please have your child ride the bus, right? And this is critically important to the district because, as you see down here, if your student does not normally ride, it's like writing a check to the district for $3,500 to support your classrooms just by riding during this week. So please do your part and help return more money back to the classroom by maximizing how many students ride the bus. You, you guys know how this works, right? So the, please ride the bus. You go ride the bus. This, this, the, they do the count. They send to the state how many kids ride the bus. The state writes them a check, which is a reimbursement. That's how these policies work in interaction. But that sets up the wrong uh, price for transportation. Um, it, it assumes that a, a particular amount of kids ride the bus, which they don't, and then um, the, the state sends a check. And so what you have is um, this, this finance formulas that are trying to take into account, oh, oops, I, didn't, I forgot, I didn't see my person over here. I'm almost dead. They try to take into account the cost of inputs. But the cost of inputs are affecting the price of services, right? So it's going from the bottom to the top and the top to the bottom. The finance formulas are, are telling us what these prices are. So to show, show you how unsustainable it is, I brought this nice chart here. The blue and the red are two different projections for how spending will play out in the next decade. And the green are likely revenues. So what we're setting ourselves up for is a, a place where we're going to cut and cut and cut. Um, year after year after year, so it doesn't work. And, and if you, if you want to see one more point of how it doesn't work here, this, this picture shows you the blue are staffing in public education um, over the years, and the gray bands are the recessions. And you can see that staffing increased right through the last three recessions, which is suggesting to us, and the red, I get, just so you can see it, is the private sector, and you can see it take, the private sector employment takes a dip every time there's a recession. But there aren't these, these, um, these forces that, that circulate back and, and put pressure on the system. So what it does is it's unable to contract. It's unable to be affected by exterior um, forces. And I'm going to leave you um, with, I'm going to leave you with this last statement and to really tie it back to show how it's part of this governance problem. And that statement is that the flawed spending patterns are enabled by too few consequences for district decisions. And that means that um, the states and the federal government give districts money, and they do with hold harmless provisions and grandfather clauses, but no, never do they take that money away. And because they don't take that money away, the system is, is becomes so entrenched and unable to change. And that's a feature of our governance structure that we've left intact and one, intact and one I hope that gets discussed today. Good morning. So my task is to talk about education governance and equity. Not, uh, kind of a serious subject, so I don't have any jokes. But, um, and, and it's a very big topic in American education, um, something I've worked on my entire career. So I decided to narrow my focus. And like Marguerite, I discussed fiscal equity because it has such powerful ramifications. But rest assured that, that my paper and, and my comments now do barely overlap with Marguerite, so of course I agree with everything she said. Uh, so since the origins of our country, public officials have shortchanged certain groups of school children, whether through formal segregation or different expectations for and then investments in them. And the results on NAEP, you all know this, uh, on reading and math assessments, these groups of disadvantaged students score at least two grade levels behind their more advantaged peers. But let me be clear, uh, to me equitable funding does not mean equal funding per student. 
It means varying funding based on student needs and school operational costs. Um, my paper is quite long and involved. It looked at the fiscal inequity situation historically and currently at the local, state, and federal levels. It discusses some notorious school desegregation cases, Kansas City and Chicago, that involved money. And it compares our system to a typical European country, and it ends with my recommendations. But I'm skipping Europe and most of the history, except to say that policymakers until this century pretty much subscribes to notions of race, ethnic, and class-based differences and learning expectations for students. And of course, they invested fewer dollars in the education of those groups of students that they considered inferior. However, in the 1950s and 60s, three major national equity, act equity actions happened. The Supreme Court's 1954 Brown decision, the enactment of the Civil Rights Act, of 1964, and in 1965, the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. While the results of these led to greater investments in minority and low-income schools, the financial disparities remain large between them and more affluent white schools. In the 1970s, states, by the 1970s, states had gradually assumed a greater share of school funding, but they mostly added on to the patterns of inequity that already existed. Surprisingly, President Nixon issued an executive order that established the President's Commission on School Finance. The commission issued its report in March 1972. Its major finding was that, and I quote, the financial problems of education derive largely from the evolving inabilities of states to create and maintain systems that provide equal educational opportunities and quality education for, to their children. The 157-page commission report is actually chock full of recommendations that eerily track today's education reform debates. If you, if you want 150 pages of easy reading, you might want to look at it. But most significant for, date, for today's discussion and its rec, um, are its recommendations for the following. Full state funding of elementary and secondary education, allowing local supplements up to 10% of the state allocation. That state budgetary and allocation criteria differentials be based on students' educational need and on variations in educational costs within various parts of a state and finally, a federal incentive grant that would reimburse states for part of the costs of raising the state education outlays, contingent upon the, and see if this sounds familiar, the submission of a state plan for achievement of full state funding over a reasonable period of time. A few months later, in 1972, the Bipartisan Senate Select Committee on Equal Educational Opportunity also noted the huge intrastate differences in per-pupil expenditures, as well as within district disparities in school expenditures. Folks, this was 1972. Forty years later, the same problems exist. So let's fast forward to today. Disadvantaged students are literally shortchanged in terms of money by local, state, and federal governments, but in different ways. And then there is the inequity even within schools, as Marguerite has often shown in her work. At least today, we understand much more about the details of fiscal inequity. Let's look at the local level. Across the country, about 40% of school funding is generated locally, mostly by property taxes. Um, but this ranges from 3% in Hawaii and 8% in Vermont to over 60% in Illinois and Nevada. The local problem is the inequitable distribution of resources within school districts. It has only become well understood in the past decade because school level budgeting or consideration of per pupil expenditures by school was never really done and certainly was not made publicly available. Instead, districts have typically sent resources to school by staff allocations and specific programs or based on requests of savvy schools. With few exceptions, high poverty schools do not receive the same per pupil allocations of non-federal funds as schools with lesser poverty. That's the comparability issue. And they rarely receive extra weighted dollars based on student need or the concentration of needy students. The Department of Education just yesterday released the first national documentation of this comparability issue. The primary reason for inequitable school funding is the difference in teacher salaries among schools, as both Marguerite and, and Checker have discussed. While the documentation of this issue is relatively recent, knowledge of the situation is not. 
Indeed, the federal government has condoned inequitable spending um, in between low and high poverty schools within school districts for decades through a major loophole in put into ESEA in 1970. States today pick up slightly more than 50% of the cost of public education on average. Um, but again, there's great visibility among states. And, and Checker noted the, the many uh, efforts by advocates and litigators battling this out in state courts and legislatures. And actually, there has been some progress uh, on, on fiscal equity within many states. At the federal level, the US, in contrast to most advanced countries, supplies just a small part of the public schools. Checker said a dime, I say 9%, whatever. The primary purpose is to provide extra funding for students and schools with the greatest educational needs, essentially weighted student funding. The biggest programs, ESEA and IDEA, both have shortcomings, but the greatest problem is in ESEA Title I. Its formula, actually four formulas, is supposed to target funds through states to schools with the greatest need based on student poverty. That's probably what you all think it does. But they don't do this very well. The four formulas have been cobbled together and layered on top of each other since 1965, and they have three problems. First, money is sent to districts based on their number of low-income children and state variation in the cost of providing education. Okay, so far. But the cost factor is state average per pupil expenditure, a proxy that continues to be used today. This is a bias in favor of wealthy states. The second problem is just one of the formulas accounts weekly for states' fiscal effort. This means that the federal government subsidizes wealthy states that tax themselves at relatively low rates while failing to reward low wealth states that may choose to tax themselves at relatively high rates. The third problem is the use of two alternate approaches to weighting the number of low-income children that drive funds to districts. The upshot is that the large school districts receive disproportionately larger allocations of Title I funds on a per low income child basis than medium sized and small, often rural districts. If we are going to prepare a future workforce that is globally competitive and sustains our democratic institutions, we must address the unfairness in the way we fund schools. While not the sole answer, the US needs to change the way it governs education finance. Before moving to my recommendations, I need to say something about whether money really matters in terms of education quality and student outcomes. A war among researchers over this question has raised, raged for years. As more has been learned about education, spending, fun, education spending and with troubling, very public examples of large sums seemingly wasted or put to poor use, there seems to be somewhat of a consensus that money matters, but not alone. Eric Hanyashek states what seems to be today's prevailing view, Provide, providing resources without changing other aspects of schools is unlikely to boost student performance. Policymakers are beginning to pay attention to the return on investment in public schooling. But changing other aspects of schools is, is essential, and many of the most important strategies for turning around low-performing schools cost extra money. Extra uh, equitable access to resource for schools is about governance, and the three-tiered system of federal and, 50, uh, federal and 50 state executive and legislators and 15,000 local decision-making bodies is not a sensible, coherent system. So what do I, I believe that a relatively simple system governing the distribution of education funds is the only way to move forward towards real equal educational opportunity. So what is needed? First, states should assume the entire cost of their public schools and adopt systems of weighted student funding. There should be extra weights for students in schools with large concentrations of low-income students. And there should be federal financial incentives to stimulate sta state action toward establishing such systems. Additionally, states should ensure that districts allocate resources to their schools in terms of real weighted dollars. This is basically the recommendation of President Nixon's Commission on School Finance. 
Each state should also develop a measure of return on investment and hold local educators accountable for their productivity of their districts through public reporting of efficiency measures. In addition, a state may, might have a wide variety of government arrangements for the design and operation of schools using the dollars allocated under a state funding system. Charter schools, districts with non-contiguous schools sharing curriculum and pedagogical Approaches, virtual schools, districts organized to further economic and or racial uh, ethnic integration of schools, state operated districts of low performing schools. We'll hear more about these um, uh, as this day goes on. Second, local districts should no longer have the power to use local property tax revenue to fund schools. All revenues supporting public schools should come from states and the federal government. Parents and other community members should be allowed to provide up to 10% extra financial assistance to schools for special programs beyond a basic high quality education offered in every school. Another Nixon Commission recommendation. Third, federal funds should support those states with insufficient wealth to generate necessary funds for schools as long as they meet a baseline level of tax effort. But to be politically viable, federal funds need to reach every state and most districts, as does the current Title I. However, Congress should redesign the Title I formula into one formula. It should drive funds based on concentrations of children from low-income families, not on raw numbers of children in poverty. It should also include measures of fiscal effort and the cost of schooling. Now this recommendation does not really change the current federal role in supporting public education, though it would require substantial political will from members of Congress to support a fairer funding system scheme. Many advocate that the proportion of federal funding support increase substantially. I agree once more federal revenue is made available. But it makes no sense for Congress to supply greater amounts of funding if it continues to do so in the inequitable way that it does today. Fourth, Congress should close the comparability loophole in Title I and prohibit the forced transfer of teachers to meet that requirement when it reauthorizes the law. In addition, in exchange for Title I funding, the federal government should make permanent the reporting of school level expenditures, which was mandated as a one-time requirement under the ARA, and which is what the, the report yesterday from the department was about. And finally, the federal government should provide competitive incentive grant funds to states and a few districts to develop and experiment with reforms such as weighted student funding systems and model measures of return on investment. So I look forward to our discussion. Good morning. So I'm, I'm excited to have this discussion today and to hear from people like Checker and Mike and my colleagues on this panel um, because they're scholars and academics who've studied these issues for years and years. I'm a journalist and so I approached this task a little bit differently. Um, as a reporter, I've been covering education issues for more than 10 years, but as I began this project, I really didn't know a lot about governance issues and how they were playing out across the country. So I set about my work the way a journalist would. I talked to a lot of people, I asked a lot of questions, and I did a lot of listening. And so what I wanted to do today was let you hear um, from the people that I talked to and, and have them tell you a little bit about how um, issues with governance were affecting that the work they were trying to do um, and the work that they wanted to do in the future. So I'll just start with um, Bill Height, who's the superintendent of Prince George's County, Maryland, right nearby. And um, he told me a story of how um, the structure there is affecting what he wants to do. Um, in Prince George's, they have a nine-member single district school board and uh, like most districts, Prince George's is facing a lot of budget cuts. So Dr. Height told me that during his most recent round of budget negotiations, he believed he'd come up with some creative solutions for pairing back programs and some personnel to keep money going toward innovative programs in the district. But what ended up happening is there were a lot of individuals and groups that lobbied the, the school board members to keep the positions and the programs that he wanted to cut. Um, and so they were worried about pleasing their constituents and of course about re-election. And so um, they didn't want to make those cuts. 
And uh, Dr. Height told me that under the current system, quote, we spend a lot more time talking about things I consider noise as opposed to addressing the real work. And he told me that the money that the board ultimately voted to keep in the budget, which he wanted to take out or put in another place, quote, would have been better spent on investments and innovative approaches. And I think that's what a, a lot of um, school leaders and school district leaders are finding when they deal with elected school boards. Um, I also talked to people in Oregon where the governor's in the process of instituting a new um, education system there, the birth through 20 education system that focuses on getting more Oregonians to get degrees beyond high school. Um, so in the, in the past, Oregon had a very partitioned system with separate state boards overseeing pre-K, K-12, and higher education policy, and they all operated pretty independently. So that caused a problem for a lot of education leaders, including Nancy Golden, who's the superintendent of the Springfield Public Schools in Oregon. Um, she told me that she was really frustrated with the unevenness of preparation for incoming kindergartners in her district because there was no um, agreement about what uh, kindergartners should be, what skills they should have, what they should learn uh, to come into school, and, and how they can be better prepared to get going immediately because there's no coordination between K-12 and pre-K in the state. Um, she also talked about, about the fact that uh, budget issues had forced her to cut technical programs for her students. But right in her community, there was a local community college that was offering these same courses. But because there was no coordination between K-12 and higher education, her students couldn't get access and take advantage of these classes at the community college. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about my discussion with the Idaho School Superintendent Tom Luna, who had pushed through a very controversial package of education reforms there, uh, which includes a requirement that students take two online courses before they graduate. It's the first in the nation to, to uh, require that. Um, as a bit of background, Idaho's economy um, is struggling, and it's meant the state has funneled more than $200 million away from K-12 education in the last couple of years. And Mr. Luna used those economic difficulties as a way to gain re uh, support for revamping the education system there. He would continually say that he couldn't keep paring down the, exi the existing system just to preserve it, that this was an opportunity to sort of rethink the system as a whole. So one of the things he talked to me about that, he, that were, was one of his concerns was that under the traditional funding structure in Idaho, schools were paid based on seat time for students. Um, but as districts began taking advantage of online courses provided by a state-funded organization, Idaho ended up paying twice for that time. So the time still counted as part of a district's per pupil funding formula, but then the state was also underwriting costs for the online school provider, which was a, a state-sponsored organization. So the new funding structure that was adopted by the Idaho legislature changes that. So now, for example, if one of a student's six classes is taught by an online provider, two-thirds of the funding for that class will go to the online provider for instruction, and then the district will keep a third for providing space and support. But what I kind of think is interesting is this is going to affect some innovators on the school district level in a very negative way. Um, I talked to the former superintendent of uh, a tiny school district called the Notice School District in Idaho, which has about 330 students. And um, this superintendent was very innovative. His, he couldn't afford to hire a Spanish teacher or a physics teacher or, um, you know, bring some of these, these teachers in. And so he created what he called Pirate Academy, which was an online uh, course uh, opportunity and so a lot of the students in the school were taking these online courses but of course their budget is very small and they rely heavily on the state funding and now that they're going to lose um, some of the funding for the students who are taking these online courses it may force them to uh, not allow students to take as many courses as they would have so these notice students might lose out on AP physics or Spanish classes or electives um, even as Idaho is requiring students to take two online courses before they graduate. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, places where there's sort of a, a less traditional governance structure and uh, people, you know, it seems to be helping uh, reforms go along. 
I talked to Deb Gist, who's the Commissioner of Education in Rhode Island, and she applauded the fact that the Rhode Island Board of Regents, which oversees K-12 education in the state, it has the power to set regulations which hold the force of law. So it's greatly simplified the system of, of putting innovative reforms into place. Um, she talked about the fact that in November, the Board of Regents approved a new teacher evaluation system which would, would take away certification from a teacher who's found ineffective for five years in a row. And um, they just adopted this rule and it's in place, it's starting in January. But in other states, this kind of change would have to be included in legislation, which could easily get bogged down in controversy and politics. Uh, but governance changes are not always so cut and dried. Um, and most of us know that in New Orleans, the education landscape there now looks nothing like it did before Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005. Before the storm, most of the public school students in the city attended Orleans Parish schools, which were plagued by low test scores and graduation rates and a host of other problems. Um, today, the city has schools overseen by three different entities. It's kind of complicated. You can see it there. Um, it's the state-run Recovery School District, Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and the Orleans Parish School Board. And there are a lot of charter schools there, um, and there were very few uh, before the storm. What is also interesting is that any New Orleans public school is open to any student living in the city limits. And since the storm, school performance has gone up, um, but not everyone there uh, thinks you know, this system is totally successful, even though it's obviously help to usher in some improvements in the school system. Um, I spoke with Sherilyn Branch, who's the principal of Benjamin Banneker Elementary School, which is directly operated by the Recovery School District, and she was also the principal of the school before the storm. She said that um, she now has more control over her curriculum and the educational decisions that she makes for her students. She said in the past, under the old system, she was basically told what to do and she had to carry that out regardless of whether she thought that was the best route for her students. But she said the problem is she often doesn't now get the money and the funding to make those choices that she has a reality or, or institute them as strongly as she'd like. Um, and she also says she supports the concept of school choice, but that she believes um, some of the schools are, are kind of working the system by cherry picking students and telling low achieving students or special education students that there's no room at their school and they should look elsewhere. In addition, she says that because schools run by the recovery district have to provide transportation for students, um, even those students who live in far flung areas of the city, a lot of her budget money goes to transportation instead of to the classroom. So these governance changes don't always solve all the problems, but they can have some interesting ripple effects that reverberate outside the systems they're directly impacting. I took a close look um, in my reporting at, the, uh, at what's going on in Indiana, where for the first time the state is taking over a handful of struggling schools, mostly in the Indianapolis school district. Um, Indiana's hired two charter school operators to run these four Indianapolis takeover schools and they'll be able to do things like hire and fire staff at will and have more flexibility in curriculum and management decisions. Um, but, and the mayor of Indianapolis has said he's going to petition the state to allow his office to oversee these takeover schools probably next year. It's kind of a unique setup there. The mayor's office in Indianapolis can charter schools and is already overseeing um, 23 charter schools. So the mayor told me he believes local control, which we heard about a little bit earlier, um, through, through his office is the best way to help these schools su succeed. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with these takeover schools, but I think it's also going to be even more interesting um, to watch the fact that these, this governance change is also indirectly having an effect on the rest of the Indianapolis school system. Um, the superintendent there, Eugene White, told me that the state takeover of four of his schools prompted him to speed up uh, a strategic plan that he had to redo district organization, um, including how he deals with struggling schools and successful schools. And he's also um, pushing forward more quickly uh, plans to pare down staff and get rid of underperforming teachers. 
So um, he said the state takeover showed everyone in the district sort of the sense of urgency behind the problems in those schools in a way that he, had, he said he had always tried to do in the past, but he never really could convey how urgent and how serious this problem was. So I think it's interesting to watch the fact that even though these four takeover schools um, are the ones that are, are being directly changed, it's also having an impact on the existing school system. So there's a lot of frustration out there about traditional governance systems and a lot of action in areas where new systems are being developed. So I'm going to watch with all of you as uh, to see how those play out and to see whether those new governance structures will make the difference for students. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm from New York City, and if you came back with me, uh, we could take a short walk from Central Park, and there we would find a school building that houses two schools. Uh, Public School 149 is governed and operated by the New York City Department of Education, and uh, another school, Harlem Success Academy, a so-called No Excuses Charter School, is run by the so-called Success Charter Network. And they both serve students from the surrounding community, which is, uh, unsurprisingly, overwhelmingly black and low income. In 2010, Harlem Success third graders, which is the first grade tested by the state, scored in the top 1% of schools in the state, outperforming their peers from wealthy surrounding school districts on the state's ELA exam. PS149 scored in the bottom 2%. So sure, it's an anecdote, but you know, it may yet prove a telling one. And beginning in the early 1990s, a growing number of reformers, and this is what I write about in the paper, concluded that the operating system, if you will, of large school systems, elected school boards, 300-page teacher contracts, neurotic district offices, and notoriously weak teacher education programs, all the things that Checker so painfully enumerated, was irretrievably broken. And rather than attempt reform from within such a system, they chose to work from outside. And they made use of hard-won legislative footholds, I'll call them, charter school laws, alternative certification pathways, virtual schools, and more, that opened the door for these kinds of entrepreneurial initiatives. Most of these initiatives will fade from view, either because they lack the capacity to transform public education or because the system proved impervious to their advances. Take SES tutoring, for example. Here yesterday, forgotten tomorrow. But I argue in my paper that disruptive innovations, to use Clay Christensen's term, although he would disagree with me about the choice, in three specific sectors, charter schools, specifically so-called no excuses schools, teacher training, and digital learning are likely to erode the long-standing governance arrangements that we have been discussing. Consider the impact already. For years, it was kind of taken that barring wholesale social change that would equalize school funding across districts and reduce racial and social economic segregation, that only modest improvements in urban student achievement, achievement could be expected. But now KIPP and other charter school networks are posting academic outcomes, at least in many schools, that truly bridge uh, the racial and economic achievement gap, if you accept state testing as the measure, but costs less to operate than district-run schools. Our schools have been staffed by teachers for decades who graduated from the bottom of their high school class and attended non-selective schools of education. This year, 18% of seniors at Harvard and other top colleges and universities are vying for admission to Teach for America bypassing traditional teacher training, they will instead undergo an intensive summer preparation to teach in impoverished urban and rural communities. Since the start of the common school, education has meant a teacher, students, and a classroom, but today more than a million elementary and secondary students take at least one course online. Each of these three reforms addresses a key component of schooling and its reform. Teacher training engages the single greatest determinant of school quality, of course, who may teach and how they equip to be effective. Charter schools remake schools 
entirely outside of district control and long-standing governance arrangements. Digital learning promises to at last substitute capital for labor and realize new learning efficiencies. In my paper, I look at each of these three innovations in some detail. Never more than a platform for change, charter legislation initially spawned, let's be honest, many schools that were barely better and often worse than district schools. But after a decade of experimentation, a model for educating students from poverty has emerged. No excuses schooling, which is now at the core of most of the charter schools that are bridging the achievement gap. New initiatives for sourcing and preparing teachers that focus on rapidly equipping well-educated and highly motivated new teachers with teaching techniques rather than pedagogical theories. No more Vygotsky and Piaget are challenging schools of education and their lock on who gets to teach. Teach for America and more recently Relay Graduate School of Education look together remarkably like the system for sourcing, training, and credentialing teachers in top performing Finland and other countries where teachers are selected from the top of their high school classes and training focuses not on theory but on intensive practice in developing and deploying lessons. Lastly, the potential of digital learning to offer low cost, effective, and engaging instruction to students anywhere, anytime is just beginning to be realized as a new generation of students arrive to school wedded to their digital devices. Much online content will be free with extraordinary implications for bricks and mortar schooling. Each of these innovations is made possible by these modest governance toeholds and also impaired by the limits of these toeholds. For example, to take just one of the sectors, digital learning is impaired by the heterogeneity of states' learning standards and assessments, funding caps, caps on the number of students who may enroll in online class or attend virtual schools, including virtual charter schools, teacher licensure requirements, student teacher ratios, mandated interaction rules between teachers and students, portability of student credits, and obsolete accreditation standards. But nonetheless, even so, each of these disruptive innovations has been able to progress. So I argue in the paper that as word spreads of these disruptive innovations and the educational opportunities they create, especially for poor kids, public support for the powerful alliance of interest groups that maintains the governance status quo is beginning to erode. We see political actors like Democrats for education reform and big city mayors that have traditionally been loyal to the teachers union <coughs> that they are adopting an increasingly jaundiced view of their aims. Existing institutions shackled by inertia and dysfunctional governance will really have an increasingly tough time competing in the new currency of academic outcomes. We see a radical shift where these actors have turned from approaching these external innovators with hostility to embracing them. Think of Mayor Menino and his change of position after 15 years on charter schools. Demonstrating larger achievement effects and lower costs than the long-standing practices they replace, these disruptive innovations will attract increasing public attention and add to the pressure on underperforming institutions, local school boards, unionized schools, SEAs, teacher colleges, and the interest groups and governance structures that sustain them. Central tenets of these interests that for so long went unchallenged, such, such as the salutary effects of schools on schools of unions, uh, the benefit of ratios, mandated ratios of students to teachers, and formal barriers to the teaching profession will be undercut. And I think this trend uh, is, is likely to continue and to be bolstered by two major governance reforms of the last two decades, state and federal accountability systems, which the move to the common core standards and corresponding assessments will greatly sharpen, which starkly reveal what is working and what is not. And then choice, choice of what school to attend, of where to teach, of what online course to take, because choice diverts talent and energy and money out of mainstream institutions and into entrepreneurial initiatives. This, I, will, I believe, will lead to a progression of modest, incremental governance reforms, strengthening these toeholds, strengthening these be beachheads, uh, that in turn will improve the efficacy and efficiency of each of the three innovations. 
And as greater stress is put on the majority institutions and the governance structures that shackle them, um, uh, we will eventually see, come to a point years from now that I think these governance structures will give, give away. After all, if no excuses charter schools uh, produce better results without unionization, without tenure, or school boards, why should these institutions retain their legitimacy? If teachers sourced through TFA and Relay get better outcomes but didn't go to ed school, how do state licensure systems retain their say on who gets to teach? If students learn mass, math much faster from watching Khan's Academy free online lessons, what is the purpose of state-mandated student-teacher ratios, and so on? So in this view, change will come incrementally to the governance of American education, spreading slowly across state jurisdictions over a period of many, many years. But as entrepreneurial initiatives benefit from seemingly modest governance reforms and gather momentum, a broader transformation of school governance may be unleashed, I argue. So in my paper, I discuss the actions that the states and the federal government could take that would add steam to the three disruptive innovations. And each such action would enhance the reach and impact of the initiatives and in turn build the case for much deeper reforms to the antiquated system. At the same time, though, I caution in the paper that education entrepreneurs, whether for profit entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, in each of the three sectors will need to attend to apparent weaknesses in their own plans, weaknesses that gravely threaten their impact and in turn the reform of school governance. So to just give one example in digital learning, uh, entrepreneurs risk squandering a decade to faulty educational designs as so sadly did the charter movement. The Industries Association um, has adopted standards for all providers, one of which requires quote unquote constructivist pedagogies and quote multiple learning styles, even though the largest study of online learning found that unfashionable didactic learning was by far the most effective pedagogy. So fearing that the buzzer is about to ring, um, <laughs> I think it, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. All right, we're off to a good start. Let's get into some conversation. I have some questions for each of our panelists. I, you know, this, this is a discussion about governance and about the challenges governance presents to our system. You know, you could listen to your comments and say, okay, these are some smart people talking about the ways in which our system is broken, uh, but is that really about governance per se? Okay, so for example, let me start with you, Marguerite. You, you say there's this $600 billion education pie and all these different players want a piece of it. They want to have some control over how it's spent and the policies that go along with it. Um, it. I mean, isn't that the same that we would have in any other sector in our society? People try to get their piece of the defense budget or health care budget. Or, is there anything about, Amer about education's governance system that makes this problem particularly acute in education? Um, I, I, yes, I think there is. And, um, one of the, what I, when I mentioned before, the, the 60,000 board members, they're very decentralized, highly, um, uh, I don't want to say unreliable, but you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of turnover in that group. An election can happen every, um, sometimes every year or every two years, and new people come on, on board with new agendas. And so given this is such a large national investment with funds coming from so many different layers, it invites this, um, this desire to create predictability in how those funds are used. And that invites the, the web of res, um, restrictions and almost entitlement-like um, prescriptions for how the money gets used. And I think that's, that's sort of what I'm, uh, I'm saying is kind of the difficulty here. The, the follow that up with the fact that there aren't um, financial consequences the way there are in other um, areas of government spending um, in the sense that money never gets taken away from a district. A district maintains um, funds even if it loses students often or even if um, even if um, it, it, it performs particularly poor, or poorly or even misspends money, the funds stay there and the district keeps moving forward. So I think those are the, the forces that are in, in the governance structure that are creating some of these problems. That, that there's just so many players involved, for one thing, and they're right. spending money that's not their own. Right. Okay. Right. So if you, if you, if you 
if you were the, um, at one of these higher levels, whether it's at the state legislature, the state education agency, or the, the uh, Department of Ed, you, um, you want to affect how the system changes, you've got to put constraints, or they, they, they think they've got to put constraints on the money because you're going to try to affect the behaviors of these 60,000 board members that are scattered all throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's what we've got here. All right, so Cindy, follow along that line of reasoning then. So uh, if you are saying we don't want to have any more local funding, you're saying the only way you're going to get to equity is to move to the states taking responsibility for raising the revenue and spending it and then spending it in a weighted student funding fashion. Um, so then what in that situation is the role for local officials? Uh, they then have, then none of the money that they're spending would be their own. So is there a role for school boards in that scenario? Uh, well, on this panel, we didn't talk about the problem of too many school districts. But that aside, yes, I think you, <clears throat> you will have local operation of schools and the design of, 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 of how schools function, whether it's a, uh, a Montessori school, elementary school, or uh, a more traditional uh, school. There are a lot, everything about design and, and who works in school systems uh, who does the actual hiring um, should be made at a, a more local level. I'm just saying that they sh that uh, local districts uh, should not be able, we, we shouldn't have a, a difference in, in how districts uh, support schooling based on uh, uh, property tax values. and. That, that this just locks in uh, inequities that if we went to the state level, obviously I don't think going to the state level solves every problem, uh, but we could get around it. I don't care how states raise revenue. They can u do it on property tax if they want, uh, but it needs to be a state property tax system, not one that, that, goes, that differs from district to district. But, but I think, uh, I, I think there are lots of different ways you could operate and design yeah. schools. Well, so let me push on this a little bit more, though, Cindy. So I mean, you're, you're making the case for a more equitable system of school finance, which I think a lot of people in this room would agree with. The question would be, is this necessarily a governance problem, or is it just that we, you know, advocates of that view, haven't marshaled the political will uh, to make that happen? Oh, it is a governance problem. We... Uh, you know, we went through a system of, what, and I talk about this some of my paper, the history, you know, from, from the beginning, we've designed um, units uh, of schools that uh, are divided by those who have and those who haven't, and we've invested differently, and that's policymakers, elected officials making decisions about how money is to be spent, as well as how to operate schools. Um, I, I definitely think it's a governance problem. Okay. Uh, Michelle, I was, I was really intrigued by the quote that you had from Deb Gist, which I tweeted, by the way. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'll stop saying the, the tweeting <laughs> jokes. Um, uh, Rethink EdGov is the hashtag, everybody out there? Okay. Um, you know, saying that a lot of the barriers that people see within the system are imagined. Right. And they're not real. We found this a couple of years ago at Fordham, a study we did with Rick Hess on teacher union contracts, that when you actually look at them, uh, there's more flexibility f for a lot of superintendents than they like to admit. And they sometimes will blame the teacher union contract for not taking the bold action that they... So, I mean, what, what's your take on this? Or do you think that the, some of the people who are complaining within the system that, well, I can't do X, Y, and Z because of my school board or because of state regulation or federal policy, that these are just excuses? I don't know if they're excuses, but I do think that is a factor out there. Um, I think it was Deb Guest, you know, she talked to me a little bit about the fact that in one of her previous uh, positions, uh, she, or actually I think it was Carol Johnson from the, the Boston Public Schools, she had talked about the fact that um, there was a principal who said he couldn't uh, do something in terms of hiring because it was prohibited by the union contract. And then when she looked at it closely, it historically was just the way the district had done things. But when she looked at the wording of the contracts and things like that, that actually wasn't the case. So I think, you know, there is a lot of sort of this is the way we've always done things out there and, uh, you know, everybody sort of going down that path and I think you know there there is some flexibility within the existing systems but I think as, as everybody's kind of talked about today also 
Um, some of these systems, you know, are inequitable. They just don't work. And I think the, uh, the example uh, that I gave from Bill Height uh, with sort of politics becoming involved, there's a lot of ways that um, when people want to innovate, want to change, that's always controversial. And it's hard to get some of these things pushed through with lobbying groups and elected positions and people being concerned about re-election and their futures. Right, and so and what, you kind of pick up then on what Marguerite's arguing, which is that the system can be very susceptible to those interest group politics. Uh, there's lots of different levers that, that groups, unions, but other groups too, that can use to try to uh, figure out how money's spent, policies are made. Okay, and, you, and, and those are real, that, that's not just imagined. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, first of all, I got to push on you a little bit. You, you sounded so optimistic there at the end. This is supposed to be a pessimistic panel. Okay, so I just want to, uh, you, uh, you were saying that, you know, over time, you know, because charter school is showing that thing, better results can happen and TFA is doing such a great job recruiting good people and um, digital learning is going to, you know, really uh, create innovation that because of this, all of these barriers are eventually going to evaporate. Um, and I want to understand better what gives you that optimism uh, that the interests in the system today that may like the system the way it is are, are going to finally give in. I mean, we've, we've seen, we've got charter school uh, markets now. We've got this, this city we're in right now, Washington, D.C., where 40% of the kids are in charter schools. Uh, other places around the country, too. And you haven't necessarily seen a huge system response uh, to that competition with major changes in most places. So what, what gives you that optimism? Yeah, I guess it does make me sound ridiculously naive. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to put it quite that way, but well, yes. Uh, but, I, but I'm still, I'm prepared to defend it. So, um, first of all, uh, this is a bit of an easy out, but I, I didn't say it would happen quickly. So I, I'm talking, you know, 20 years kind of time frame, but in education that's, you know, short. <laughs> that's fast, right? So uh, my point is just that I, I, I guess I would, I, would, I would respond, Mike, by saying it's already happening. If you look at the, the change, for example, in who is appointed to key rulemaking positions, for example, in SEAs, uh, the appointment of Chris Cerf, who we'll hear from at lunch, to uh, be commissioner of New Jersey, or the, uh, the two recent commissioners uh, in New York City, these are, these are people who came out of the charter school uh, entrepreneurial world, and they have a fundamentally different conception of what education policy should look like. Uh, so we are seeing a sea change. Look at, what D, uh, look at what Democrats for Education Reform is doing with um, their influence on political races at the local uh, and state level. We are seeing who is running schools beginning to change, and these people have radically different attitudes and are far more welcoming of these kinds of incursions from outside. In fact, they're com sort of competing to show who is, is closer to them and more supportive of them. That is unheard of 10, 15 years ago, where there was uniform hostility to these kinds of initiatives. Um, and secondly, while charter schools have a, a, a very uh, rough uh, past, I think we are now finally ch chancing upon some approaches that have very powerful uh, learning effects. Um, so when you combine, uh, you know, oftentimes when you have different educational interventions, you have to apply gazillions of statistics to determine whether there's any real outcome difference or not. We're finally seeing interventions where the difference in outcomes are very stark. And I think that that's going to begin to call the question of whether the rules that restrict districts from performing better are, should stay. That's, that's basically my argument. So I, I think um, what's holding us up is, is a gov an actual governance problem, which is, um, is that the local school systems are promised exclusivity or m to be the promise the power to be a monopoly provider. Um, and they're promised that um, with the guarantee that the money will still come. And so only when you see these other things is because we've made a teeny little workaround or somebody's made a concession or there's a state law in charter schools or, or Wendy Cop's done kind of a deal with the district and they've agreed. But those don't have to happen, which is why they're not happening in most places. And I think what you hear here, what you heard at least from Cindy and I is we're kind of, we still would be, we still like this idea of elements of local control with schools. But 
you, you can't couple that with a promise of being a monopoly provider and a guarantee um, of, of funds, you know, regardless of, of what you do. And that's the, the sort of the problem that I think we have. It's the resistance to change and the, the way these, these things try to invite predictability and the use of funds and everything else like that. Now, you know, so here we are in 2011 talking about this. And isn't, doesn't this sound awfully familiar to what, what uh, Chubb and Moe wrote in, in the 1990 politics, markets, and public schools? I mean, this is, you know, saying that, okay, we've got this convoluted governance system and all these cooks in, in the kitchen, and so we need to bust through that with school choice, or we need to bust through that with charter schools. I, I mean, how is this different than just, uh, or, or maybe you're saying, are we just saying, hey, we just need every school to be a charter school, and we'd be able to cut through all of this? No. That, that's actually not what I was saying. But. Nor me either. I mean, right. do tell. <laughs> Look, I, uh, th th talking about the no excuses schools, those are almost all affiliated with charter management organizations. And, and they have had a powerful effect on the quality of uh, charter schools. And uh, they're not individual charter schools, Mike. They're, they're, they're organizations. Exactly, they're organizations. They, they have quality controls. Uh, they have philosophies, which is hugely important. So um, I, I think that uh, I'm on the board of a freestanding charter school. And I'll tell you, we've got problems that uh, those affiliated with charter management organizations don't have. And I think the same is probably true for virtual schools. Uh, I, I think there's some interesting arrangements that could happen around um, even traditional public, well, I want to break up traditional public schools, but, uh, but traditional public schools that are brought together with similar themes or philosophies about uh, curriculum and pedagogy uh, that we ought to be trying out. I do think there is a lot going on in the online education world with virtual providers and things like that that uh, we're going to see forcing changes. There's, there's a huge contingent of for-profit providers. There are these state-sponsored schools, and I think they are going to uh, sometime in the future force some changes um, as they become more popular and, and people opt to use them more often. But what makes that so slow to take hold is this kind of double funding thing that you mentioned that started off in Idaho, which is uh, we're going to fund these innovations and we're going to fund the existing system. As I, I, never mind if you know 200 kids leave the system and go to a charter school, we'll still give you the funding because we know that your system cannot shrink and let go of one single teacher. But don't you think that eventually will, I completely agree with you, but don't you think that will eventually change? I mean, that happened in Massachusetts, for example, the so-called reimbursement of districts, which I just thought it was a wonderful term, <laughs> right. for, for, for districts that are no longer educating. It's like, I don't take the, my clothes to this dry cleaner, but he still gets paid anyway. Right. No, uh, I, I think it and, has and to change. The public is going to get to fed up with that. Yeah. that. That's not going to stand for too long, right? Right. That's where the opening is. That's right? the opening, exactly. That's the sustainability of it. Now, you know, this issue of too many cooks in the kitchen, I mean, Marguerite's paper gets at this so well, uh, but others also. And so, again, I'm curious if there's too many cooks in the kitchen, who do we kick out of the kitchen? Locals on financing. Well, <laughs> so there's a caution I want to say, is that if you move all to state funding, voters are less likely to vote for education funds. So a frustrating consequence of shifting more money to the state level is less money in the pot. So I just, I want to put that out. I'm, I, I'm not sure that'll happen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Americans are getting more and more concerned about um, quality of education. They're really concerned when when jobs that existed are going away and that new jobs require They're still going to vote for a local levy before they vote for a state revenue source. So I, that, I just put that on the, the, the table. But, but I'm not sure you're going to have, um, uh, you're, you're going to have votes on local education expended by referenda. I think you're, you're going to have state legislators uh, making decisions, and maybe it, it will happen the way you describe, but it's a different um, governing system, uh, d d d democratic system that plays out 
when you do it at the state level than the local. All right, so we'll, we'll, to answer your question, yeah. though, if if the if right now what we have are our states and the federal government, and everybody else trying to affect the spending. So they say, here's some money, and you can only use it for X, Y, and Z, or here's some money, but you got to make sure you do this and this with the money. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, here's some money, do a good job with it, and, if, and we'll measure the outcomes. And if you don't do a good job with it, we're going to move it to a, a better spot or a more promising spot. That's a different relationship. We've, mm -hmm. The system's gone with the, I will tell you how to spend it, which means that you cannot hold them accountable anymore. Right. Um, accountable in the sense that you cannot choose to move it if they didn't spend it right because you told them how to spend it. So instead of telling them how to spend it, mm -hmm. you take that cook out of the kitchen, but that cook still retains the control to withdraw the funds. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with where Marguerite wants to go in terms of moving money. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> now, Steve, when, when you see this promising uh, future that people do start to respond to competition, I mean, do you see that happening through governance changes, per se? Like, do local, you know, big cities, school districts start to change the way they operate and their structures, they remove school, or is it just that they figure out ways to make the current system work better? I think, I think a bit of both. I mean, if, first of all, the governance structures that the outsiders have to work with have to be strengthened, right, as we heard. So th they're, they're better, much better than what districts have to function under, but they're flawed too. So I think first we'll see, as we already have seen, uh, for example, in the progress of charter school legislation from the original adoption of laws in each state as they caps are lifted and as they are amended, they, the laws improve over time. They, they never get worse. And so the circumstances against which the outsiders play in their sandbox are going to look better and better and better against the district. And at some point, the district is going to, ha is going to say, we can't succeed if our hands are tied similarly. Mm -hmm. And they're going to cause, they're going to ask for uh, some of these same flexibilities and privileges. Mm -hmm. and. And that, that, too, is already beginning to happen in modest ways. It really has to happen. I, I don't see how it could otherwise, because the, 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 the district systems function as employment systems for teachers and not as education systems. They function in the adults' interests and not the children's. And the circumstances under which they try and operate are so ridiculously uh, constrained that this contrast, I think, is going to grow and grow, contrast in outcomes and contrast in governance arrangements. And and they're going to influence each other. All right, I want to get the audience involved here, all of you. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We've got some microphones, and we'll come along uh, and get to you. If you are watching online, you can send this uh, questions to uh, Daniela. What do, we, what do we have here? Questions at edexcellence.net? Questions at edexcellence.net. OK, anybody have a question? I'll do the uh, usual thing we have to do with these DC things. It's got to be a question, not a speech. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, get right to the question if you can. Uh, we've got some folks uh, over there. Yeah, go pick one. All right. My name's Lee Young. I just want to. In the, the financing or appropriation of the fund for the schools or colleges, very often they just sort of redirect the resources to benefit some other sector, especially including non-profit organizations, which is not part of the government. And so if we are doing like this, how are we going to say, now the fund is based on the, the state level. If you have seen the based on the level, the means the, the possibly a wealthy and educated district, the Montgomery County, Maryland, they can really use the resources from the state. The means they are taking the resources, the taxpayers' money from the poor district, like PG County or Baltimore County. So I just wonder if you can really, really to sort of study more deeply uh, how are they going to use the resources so that there will be equity and will be more, pro have a higher achievement and performance. So um, 
What I was uh, uh, re advocating for was that um, revenue be raised in both Rob uh, Baltimore, Prince George's County, and Montgomery, but they have different tax bases and they d different wealth, and they can generate different amounts of money per person. And but it all goes to the state level, and then is distributed based on weighted student funding, based on student needs. So there are more needy students in Baltimore than there are. Montgomery County and Prince George's County, though they have a pretty large share of needy students as well. But when you go to weighted student funding, then the, the, there's no problem. You're not taking money away from poor kids. It, it, it's much fairer, and, and then the local um, educators decide how best to spend the money. But. but can I ask, how realistic is it to think that, that states are gonna go to that type of system? I mean. Well, you, you, ha you have states that almost do that now. I mean, why is yeah, it? Do you mean on the revenue side or the spending side? Uh, I guess on the spending side. Yeah. So, inter yeah, interestingly, most states disseminate at least some portion of their money on per pupil terms mm -hmm. and, and some, and some, some parts of it. So it's, but it's I mean, more to about take, to take it really from a local system where you're collecting revenue and then it, it, on the local level and just do it purely from the state level. Oh, you mean, yeah. so yeah, that's well, the revenue. Yeah. Well, well, that's Vermont and, and, and there are other, there are any number of states that, that um, you know, might distribute 60, 70% of the education funding. Uh, to to their local districts and schools. So, um, well, it's just let me, a wide variation. Let me let me keep pushing on this, and I think this is going to keep coming up throughout the day. You know, we have this hope that if we could change the structures and the governance, then the common good could be better served, and we we can kind of say, okay, we would all say that the common good is more equity in funding. Uh, the common good is having local school principals be able to make rational decisions that make sense educationally. Um, and that right now our system is so susceptible to politics that basically we have, the, the way democracy is playing out is not working. And particularly because interest groups like the unions but other interest groups too have too many ways of, of thwarting that common good. Are we kidding ourselves though that any structure we come up to, any, any kind of structure we have unless we put you know, somebody in charge, we make Arne Duncan the dictator of the public schools is gonna be susceptible to interest group politics, right? Right. I, I, I think what the problem is, because the interest group politics, and it's not just interest groups, I mean, it's, it's, it's every bit of the forces that are on there. Right. there Including, is no, say, affluent parents who want right, more money for their right. kids, right? There's yeah. no counter pressure to that right now. So that gets mixed in equally with the interest groups who just want better outcomes for kids. I mean, they're all, that's actually an interest group instead of an, a, 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 a counter force. And if, the, if um, that's why I keep talking about the money, if the, if the money got moved, if the, the provider was not meeting that basic outcome, then the it would put pressure back on the interest groups. Because if the interest group said, we want more spending on football, 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 or something, not to pick on football, and they spend half of their budget on football, but the kids weren't learning how to read, then that program shuts down and, the, and another one opens up. So then they, the, that's a counter pressure to that. Right now, we don't have any counter pressure to that. Okay, good. Let's take another question. I'm having a hard time seeing with the lights. Yeah. So uh, folks with the microphones, you make the call, okay? We'll go right here oh. first and then back here. Okay. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm Barry Stern, a senior advisor to the Haverman Educational Foundation. Uh, my concern is an overly lawyered... Wait, wait, what's the, what's the question? Not a concern. I want to hear a question. Yeah, the question is uh, what can be done through governance for our over-regulated, over-lawyered system? In my county, they build, um, uh, they have a Promethean board, a, a interactive whiteboard in every classroom. But parents have to raise money through bake sales to get a playground. Uh, you can't find uh, ropes up to the ceiling in any school gymnasium in, in Loudoun County today. Uh, you can't find trampolines in any gymnasium. Today. Kids are not allowed to write, not allowed to uh, okay. drink out of glass bottles. Um, they have con they have uh, assemblies on uh, on bullying. Uh, uh, th there's just so many the school districts are just scared to death of not getting sued. Mm -hmm. How can governance change that? Hey, that that's a really good point. Is that the courts are a big issue here in governance? They are part of the governance system, in effect. Um, do any of these reforms figure out that particular issue about how to uh, cut through that that over lawyering problem? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Wow. Okay. Dock at that one for consideration, Paul and Pat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a leadership problem, basically. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 we, we, you know, this notion of over-lawyering gets a little carried away, too. You have to have grounds for, you know, you have to, you just can't say my kid didn't get the same, uh, didn't get what he wanted. You have to have show discrimination, denial of due process. I mean, I, I don't think, there are a lot of lawsuits that are dismissed. Um, All right, but, but I think we would say that, you know, say in the issues of free speech, uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, and, you know, if you're a school principal, it's not all that clear uh, what you can and cannot do uh, in terms of enforcing, uh, you know, rules of, you know, the kid puts up the bong hits for Jesus poster. Is that allowable yeah. or not? As uh, Justice Scalia said, if it's uh, wine sips for Jesus, maybe it's different. Um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of confusion. Yeah, and, no, and that, I, well, a lot of the, the suits, though, come with this premise that the, one of the higher levels dictated that the lower level had to use their money in some way, and they're suing because they didn't. And so in a way, if, if we stop with those prescriptions about how the money is used and instead measured the outcomes, then we might create fewer grounds for, for that kind of a lawsuit. But you do see all the time that, you know, that the, the state or the federal government says, you know, this is a pot of money that needs to be used for, used for this, and then people say, well, I didn't get that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're, they're suing. It's well, all about the money for you, isn't I, it, Margaret? Can I, it's all about the money. <laughs> can I just add one thing? I know uh, I talked about um, Oregon earlier in this new system that they're instituting, and part of it is that uh, the, each district in the state will have compacts um, with the Oregon Education Department, and it's going to be sort of a tight, loose arrangement in which if your district is meeting the goals that, it, that have been set out, you're going to be freed up from a lot of the regulations. Maybe it's not the rope climbing regulation, but other types of regulations. And so um, districts that are meeting their goals are, are going to be freed up from, from a lot of these prescriptions. Okay, one more question in the back here. Yes, Kathy Cox with the Education Delivery Institute. So if the problem is essentially too many cooks in the kitchen, then why over the last 10 to 20 years have the two states that are leading in student achievement closing gaps, Texas and Florida? They got a lot of cooks. They're huge. They got a lot of districts. They got a lot of kids. They got a lot of people. But those two states are leading in terms of student growth and achievement. So I'm questioning whether the issue is really about an accountability system rather than a governance system. Let's throw that out. Yeah, great question. Well, I, you know, I, I think both are important. If anybody who knows me knows I feel that way. Um, but Florida, that's a county-wide system. I think they're able to take uh, do initiatives that make more sense um, than states that have little bitty districts. Now, Texas has a lot of little bitty um, districts and a lot of big cities. The, I, I'm very interested in Texas because uh, particularly when you compare Texas and California because they have similar demographics, both majority minority, huge Latino populations. African Americans and Latinos in Texas on NAEP score above the national average. California, all kids in California are hanging out with Mississippi on, on NAEP scores, yet those states look alike. I think that the story has to do with uh, innovation and reform in the big cities of Texas, and that's why you get the results on NAEP. They uh, way outweigh what's going on in the more rural, small school districts in Texas. But, um, so, I, you know, I think leadership's important uh, besides government arrangements. Steve, you, you've, you've spent a lot of your time in Massachusetts. Um, I mean, what's your sense of, you know, there again, you have plenty of small little districts. Um, you know, Massachusetts made huge gains as well. Is governance just a moot point there? What? Oh, not at all. I mean, the, if you look at the 1993 Education Reform Act, it addressed, or at least attempted very aggressively to address many of the things that have come up at this panel. So with school funding, it didn't go all the way, of course, to what Cindy and Marguerite are describing. But it did establish that uh, every district 
every, every locality had to meet a certain standard of effort, so-called a funding, which assured that every district put, contributed to a central pot a certain amount of money. Uh, and it guaranteed every school district a so-called foundation budget under which it was deemed that you would have enough money to run good quality schools. Unlike Cindy's plan, it did not cap how much additional money you could choose to add to that. But it did guarantee everybody a base level of funding. So it was a quite innovative funding arrangement. It also had very strong elements of competition injected in the system with one of the strongest charter laws, which has had a huge impact, especially in the large districts. In Boston, uh, the, the charter schools are absolutely extraordinary consistently in outcomes um, and have, give the, have given the district a real run for their money. So, uh, I mean, that was an example of a, a comprehensive effort to, uh, to, I mean, and also on governance fronts, it had, had explicit governance changes, some of which were successful and some of which were so politically diluted as to actually make things worse. But for example, it prohibited principals as the CEOs of their schools from being unionized themselves. That was a very important change. Uh, it, um, it made tenure worse, unfortunately not better, even though it was described as reforming tenure. But all in all, um, it, was a, it had a very powerful positive impact, and, and by, I'm leaving out by far the most important one, which is that it got standards and accountability right. It established uh, rigorous, very ambitious academic standards with very high quality assessments, the MCAS, and it's had a huge impact. Now Massachusetts scores, if you look at it on the NAEP, uh, very strongly and competes with some of the top performing countries in the world. So it can be done. Okay, we're gonna leave it on that positive note. Please join me in thanking our great panel. Kick it off today.